So normally in a video like this, I would start by playing you the two songs and letting you decide for yourself. You know, do they sound the same? But we can't do this here. And the reason for that is that both of these songs were recorded before 1978. And you might ask, what's the significance of 1978? Well, Congress passed the first major copyright law uh, in 1909. And in 1909, you know, music wasn't really widely distributed as recorded. You know, it was played from sheet music, either by humans or occasionally by player pianos. But the phonograph was a relatively new invention. So, the 1909 copyright law provided for artists to copyright their sheet music, you know, the composition itself, but not really anything beyond that. And Congress being Congress, it took them until 1976 to update this law. And among the updates was, you know, allowing for artists to copyright the sound recording of their song as well as the composition. And, you know, that law went into effect for all recordings after January 1st, 1978. So, in this case, we actually have to evaluate the songs purely on what the sheet music looked like. And, you know, uh, compare between the two the chord progressions, the melodies, the bass lines, and decide from that. We can't actually listen to the songs and say, oh, well, both of them have a similar ambiance, or even both of them use acoustic guitar. We have to go off what the original sheet music said. So during the actual trial in front of the jury, each side had an expert that was an acoustic guitar player for Spirit and a piano player for Led Zeppelin play the sheet music that was submitted to the copyright office of each band's respective song. I don't have that sheet music, nor do I have the recording of the expert player playing it. What I'm going to do for you guys is play a very basic acoustic guitar transcription of the songs that hopefully isolates the parts that are alleged to be copied and does not add in the extraneous details that were you know, called upon by spirit, but thrown out by the judge, you know, actually in summary judgment, uh, because they were not, you know, part of the original sheet music. Here's the pattern from Taurus. <laughs> Here's the pattern from Stairway to Heaven. So in most copyright infringement course, court cases, it's extremely difficult to provide direct evidence of copying. So there are two sort of court standards that you can use in order to show evidence of copying. The first is uh, you can actually show, even if you don't have any evidence of, you know, the accused party's access to the work that was supposedly copied, if you show that there's a striking similarity between the two works, in this case the two songs, um, that counts as enough to demonstrate copying. In this case, during the summary judgment phase, the uh, judge did not find enough you know, evidence uh, to show striking similarity between the two songs. So it fell to the second way that you can demonstrate copying. Um, and that's if the songs show substantial simu similarity and also uh, if the, you know, accuser can show evidence that the accused party had access to the work that was supposedly copied. So in this case, um, the jury actually agreed with uh, spirit um, that Led Zeppelin had access to uh, their song Taurus because um, Led Zeppelin had appeared at a number of shows in the United States with uh, spirit and Jimmy Page and Robert Plant had uh, you know been interviewed and recommended the band uh, they had their albums in their collection um, and generally they were performing in the same milieu um, so the jury actually found that, yes, uh, there was reason to believe that Led Zeppelin had access to the song. 
Um, however, where they diverged was that the jury did not find substantial similarity between the two songs. So one of the most powerful arguments brought by the plaintiff's spirit uh, was made by one of their experts, uh, a music professor at UVM named uh, Alexander Stewart. And he noted that while many songs involve, you know, descending, chromatic, minor uh, chord progressions, one thing that's sort of unusual about the spirit progression is that it actually avoids the dominant chord, uh, E major, before returning to the tonic chord, A minor. Um, so in almost all of the songs that were brought up by the defendants, Led Zeppelin, uh, they featured in some way, you know, the, this E chord in the, you know, seventh or eighth measure before returning to the tonic to start over the, you know, the looped progression. Um, but in both the Spirit song and in Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, uh, this dominant chord, E, is actually avoided. Um, and I'll show you how we did that with the sheet music. So first I'm going to play you Taurus, and then I'm going to play you Stairway to Heaven. Uh, and then I'll play both at the same time, just for fun. I've set it to play with an acoustic guitar, and note that I've written the chord symbols out, and they're the exact same for the first three measures, um, and only differ for the fourth measure. All right, so here's Taurus. And now here's Stairway to Heaven. One thing to notice here is that these notes that I'm selecting uh, are exactly the same between the two pieces. This is the descending bass line that um, is sort of the center of discussion. Um, and while the arpeggios may be a little different across the two, um, it's clear that for one, both of them use this sort of repeated uh, C to E note. Um, in Stairway to Heaven, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, but it's always in the same spot um, and serves the same function. And then second of all, the fact that we've got these repeating arpeggios as we descend through the same chord progression in three measures. Um, and the fourth measure is different between the two, but what's notable about the fourth measure is that in most songs uh, that feature this chord progression and in all the prior evidence um, of art shown by the Led Zeppelin folks, um, the artist frequently uses a uh, dominant note uh, an E chord in this measure, but in the case of both Taurus and Stairway to Heaven, they managed to avoid the dominant, which is unusual when going back to the tonic, which is the sort of main note of the key, um, at, you know, in the beginning of the next phrase. Um, so the fact that both of, both of the songs, albeit in different ways, avoid using the dominant to return to the tonic, um, and especially they go back to the tonic actually in the fourth measure, both of them see this as an A, and this is an A as well. Um, slightly different chord qualities, perhaps, but largely the same. Um, the fact that they both use that tonic in the fourth measure and avoid the dominant uh, is indicative of, you know, a facet of a specific song written facet rather than sort of a generic uh, music trope or tendency. So there are two relatively recent court cases that uh, are relevant to this decision. The first one came in 2005 um, called Bridgeport Music v. Dimension Films, uh, and it concerned an NWA song which used a two-second sample of a guitar riff from a song called, or a song by a band called Funkadelic. Um, and, you know, the producers for NWA pitch shifted it and changed the tempo uh, and used it in the song. You know, it sounds nothing like the uh, Funkadelic song. Uh, but the court ruled that basically with sound recordings, it doesn't matter how little you take uh, 
you know, it's still copyright infringement. Um, so they basically uh, got rid of what's called a de minimis uh, defense for, you know, infringing on copyright on sound recordings. That did leave open still fair use defenses, um, but the point was that, you know, just because it's a small section that you're taking, at least in terms of a sound recording, does not make it okay. You know, in, in terms of applying that case to this one, it only sort of tangentially applies because we're not talking about a sound recording, we're just talking about the music. In terms of applying Bridgeport v. Dimension, I think the key takeaway is that just because it's a small section is not an excuse for infringement, even as a general idea, even though the you know specifics may not exactly apply. The other case that's relevant uh, actually went down just this past year in 2015, uh, it was Pharrell Williams and a bunch of other people uh, v. Bridgeport Music again, uh, and it concerned the song Blurred Lines. Um, so the estate of Marvin Gaye's family uh, made the argument that um, Blurred Lines infringed on a Marvin Gaye song called Got to Give It Up. Um, and this was a very controversial case because <laughs> uh, Robin Thicke, who's the main performer on Blurred Lines, uh, and sort of the, you know, team that made the song freely admitted that they were inspired by the Marvin Gaye track. And so the question sort of was, you know, if you're recreating a feel or if, you know, you're taking indirectly off a, another song, does that constitute infringement? And the judge actually ruled in favor of Marvin Gaye to the surprise of many and the disappointment of many. Um, because they said that, you know, the two works were similar enough to constitute infringement. Um, and for Williams and a host of other people who were involved in making the song had to pay a bunch of money to the family of Marvin Gaye. Um, so that ruling is relevant because the Led Zeppelin case, which was decided in favor of Led Zeppelin, um, actually seems to, you know, work in the other direction of the Robin Thicke Blurred Lines case, because after that case came out, many people thought that, you know, even for the smallest samples and, you know, the vaguest similarities between two pieces of music, there would be lawsuits, you know, creativity would be stifled and artists wouldn't really be able to freely draw on inspirations and, you know, use the inherently limited possibilities of music to create their stuff. Um, so this Led Zeppelin case, in many ways, serves as a counter to that case in the sense that, uh, you know, even these songs which to, you know, most ears bear a lot of similarity, uh, the court decided, rightly or wrongly, that uh, they were not close enough to constitute uh, infringement. So I think that the Led Zeppelin case sort of reverses the trend that we saw in the Robin Thicke case towards, you know, lawsuits for the slightest, you know, similarity between songs. Um, so in that sense, it's a good countercurrent and shows that there's still a lot to be decided by the courts on what constitutes infringement, especially in this new age that we have of sampling in music and of, you know, drawing on earlier influences and earlier sounds that weren't really possible in the same ways before. So one thing that you might wonder about this case is, you know, why is it happening now? And that's actually a great question, um, because both of these songs were recorded, you know, over 40 years ago. And the answer to that is sort of a complicated one. Uh, you know, I think no one's surprised to know that the members of Spirit heard, you know, Stairway to Heaven during their lives, uh, <laughs> one of the most famous rock songs of all time. Um, but the songwriter, uh, Randy Wolf, did not bring suit against Led Zeppelin during his lifetime, although, uh, you know, the plaintiffs provided testimony showing that he was upset by the um, ripoff and, or by the alleged ripoff, <laughs> um, and that he actually had intended to bring suit. Um, but also, the other factor here is that Led Zeppelin released a remastered version of Stairway to Heaven um, in 2014 and copyright law includes something called a statute of limitations uh, that m means that basically any suit uh, has to regard a performance in the past three years or an infringement in the past three years. 
So because Led Zeppelin released this new version, that enabled the uh, estate of the songwriter uh, to open this suit. And the judge actually agreed with the plaintiffs in, on this front um, during the summary judgment period of the trial uh, and, you know, granted them the ability to make suit. Though, Led Zeppelin argued that because so many years had transpired, a lot of the evidence that would have been, you know, in their favor uh, had passed for one way or another. Um, so that was another factor in the jury's decision and will be relevant in the appeal of the case that is going to occur. So in terms of my personal opinions on the decision, um, I'm very sympathetic to Led Zeppelin in the sense that, um, you know, their, the suit was not raised until over 40 years after, you know, the song was recorded and it's clear that Randy Wolf did not you know, take his time to pursue a lawsuit during his lifetime. Um, so it seems to me a bit like this whole lawsuit is sort of a money grab by the estate of the songwriter rather than a genuine quarrel with, you know, by himself. Um, you know, if you look at somebody like Tom Petty, he has re repeatedly, you know, forgiven artists for uh, infringements that, you know, other artists might have taken issue with. So. It seems like the artist's intent should be taken into account with these issues, even if in this case, you know, you can't really necessarily incorporate that into an actual decision. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm actually really sympathetic to the spirit case as well, because uh, I think that <laughs> there is no doubt that uh, the songs are really quite similar. Um, and since the jury found that their Led Zeppelin had access to Spirit's song, and it seems, you know, quite likely that Jimmy Page heard it, um, I would not be surprised if the song, if, you know, if, uh, Taurus went into inspiring, uh, Stairway to Heaven. And as someone who's written songs myself, one thing that I've found is even if I'm not consciously drawing on something else, I will often compose something and then later go back to it and say, oh, you know, that was clearly, I was thinking of this other song um, while I was writing it, even if I didn't intend to do that. So, um, and of course, intent is never a, a defense in copying. So I think the fact that, uh, or the idea that these songs are not substantially musically similar um, especially in light of the Blurred Lines case, uh, which was, you know, decided in favor of the uh, plaintiffs. I think that, um, you know, this case was wrongly decided and, you know, it's possible that there was jury prejudice towards Led Zeppelin, given that there are probably a number of fans, you know, of the band on the jury. Um, and I think also the fact that these songs were recorded before the 1976 Copyright Act also had a substantial effect on the decision in the case. You know, if they had been able to listen to the actual recordings, which carry a very similar ambiance, they both involve finger-picked acoustic guitar with a lot of reverb. Um, you know, they might have had more reason to decide in favor of spirit because you know there are elements of the recording that aren't you know written down um, that you know make the copying even more apparent than it would otherwise seem. So yeah, in conclusion, I, I, you know, dissent from the decision of the jury, but uh, I also am not, do not feel a particular sense of injustice on behalf of the plaintiffs, given that they are not, you know, the original songwriter, and it uh, seems pretty clear that it's just an effort to make some money. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and let me know in the comments if you have any questions.